Today Show with Alex V. A sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. And now, here is Alex V. Okay, here we go. We want to welcome you and thank you for checking out the Yay or Nay show with Alex C., the sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. Um, okay, a lot of stuff to go over today. Absolutely lots of stuff. Now, I had like this show kind of pre-planned, ready to go, as I normally do. And then I got hit by a Mack truck known as Cam Newton and the New England Patriots, the big story that's going on there. Uh, we'll get into that a little later on, though. But yesterday I did tell you I was going to lead with the New York Mets and what seems to be a love-hate relationship between the Mets and the fans. And I definitely want to talk about that today. Um, so let's start with this. Uh, let's go to the story and let's read a little bit about the story and then we could basically go from there. So the story headline that came out started with, In Queens, the Mets give their fans a Bronx cheer. And then the story goes, Showing off their sensitivity, Francisco Lindor, Javier Baez, and Kevin Pillar celebrated a win by making thumbs-down gestures at the fans who had booed them. All right, now to continue on in the story, it says, The funniest thing about the Mets is the players – Pious self-image over and over, they emphasize that they are all about positivity, and if you doubt them or point out a flaw, you're a hater. They seem to believe they're entitled to praise no matter their performance. Mets fans believe in us, and don't just believe, no, Pete Alonzo said after the Mets fell out of first place three weeks ago. Just smile and know that we got this. Mostly the fans play along. They want to believe in Alonzo and his talented teammates, but now it has gotten personal. And with an aggrieved attitude infecting this Mets roster, it's all but inevitable. On Sunday, the Mets scored a 9-4 win over a sickly Washington Nationals team who's gutted by trades, and it gave them a series victory after a 2-11 stretch against the L.A. Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants that exposed them as pretenders. They are about to miss the playoffs for the fifth consecutive season. But beating the Nationals made the Mets feel proud of themselves, and they got so cocky, in fact, that some of the players, including Javier Baez, Francisco Lindor, and Kevin Pillar, decided to teach those mean fans a lesson by flashing thumbs-down gestures to the customers at City Field. What did it mean? Here is how Baez explained it in his virtual news conference after the game. Just the booze that we've got, said Baez, who homered on Sunday and is now hitting 210 as a Met. We're not machines. We're going to struggle. We're going to struggle seven times out of 10. It just feels bad when I strike out and I get booed. It doesn't really get to me, but I want to let them know that when we're a success, we're going to do the same thing to let them know how it feels. Because if we win together, then we've got to lose together. And the fans are really a big part of it. In my case, they got to be better. I play for the fans and I love the fans, but if they're going to do that, they're just putting more pressure on the team and that's not what we want. Okay, now this story has a lot of different moving parts to it. Uh, for starters, number one, there's a lot of yay or nay to this, right? So first of all, you either are yay a fan of the Mets, or you are, nay, not a fan of the Mets, right? I mean, that's obvious. So you either are or you aren't. Now, if you are, specifically, that is who this story is talking to. The fans that are booing and not necessarily supporting their team through the thick and thin, because players believe that fans should support the teams through thick and thin. We've heard that a million times before. That's not a new statement. That's not anything new. That's something that players have said over and over for decades and decades. We've been hearing the same storyline. So it's not, again, anything new that we're hearing now. A lot of players expect fans to go ahead and support them through the thick and thin, no matter what's going on. If they're winning, they want your support. If they're losing, they want your support. Okay, now that's one side of it. That's the players' side of it, who are saying that you need to be yay all about the team at all times. Again, we've heard this a million times before. This is nothing new. But here's the thing. What players don't realize is there's another side to this equation, and it's the nay side of the equation, right? As fans, we have the right to boo 
when our team is not performing to expectations. Now, in this instance, because we're specifically talking about the New York Mets, let's think of this. You're in first place. You're rolling. You're about to make the playoffs for the first time in five years. Now, all of a sudden, a losing streak hits. You're about to once again, for the fifth consecutive season, miss the postseason. Now, if you're rolling and you all of a sudden start losing, are you as a player saying to the fans that they're not supposed to get depressed and bummed out and eventually fed up with the fact that you continue to choke? Because that's what's going on. Because keep in mind, you were in first place. It's not like you were in last place all season long and all of a sudden fans just decided to stop supporting you, right? Arizona Diamondbacks are losing, have been losing all year long, and the fans aren't booing them. They're not saying anything bad to them because they don't have any expectations of the Arizona Diamondbacks. So nobody's really saying anything bad to the players or anything of the like when it comes to Arizona Diamondback games because they have no expectations. But the Mets were in first place. The fans were excited. They finally felt like they could have some expectations in regards to their team. Then the team starts losing and lets them down. So you as a player are trying to say that fans should not feel let down, depressed, bummed out, and eventually upset, and then, of course, express how upset they are with you that you went from first to worst? I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. You went from first to worst, okay? You gave the fans expectations, unlike the story and the example I just gave about the Arizona Diamondbacks. So you gave the fans expectations, and then you took those expectations away by going on a losing streak. And then, to top it all off, you think that they're not supposed to say anything negative. They're supposed to just love you all the way through and through. But here's what doesn't make sense with that philosophy. If they're supposed to love you all the way through and through when you're good and when you're bad, well, then you have to look yourself in the mirror as a player and you have to ask yourself one simple question. Why do teams trade me away? Think about it. Why do teams trade you away? If you're so good, if everybody's supposed to love you throughout your entire career, and if they're supposed to support you throughout the entirety of your career, why do you get traded away? Why are you playing for other ball clubs? Why are you not with the original ball club that you started with? Because you weren't good enough. You demanded too much money. You couldn't get along with management. You couldn't get along with other players. Now, again, if it's all about kumbayas and it's all about love, then you wouldn't get traded from organization to organization as a player. So your philosophy has big holes in it. And here's another thing. For fans who love players, fall in love with certain players, got certain players they would love nothing more than to watch them play their entire career for their particular sports team. And then those players get up and they leave because they're chasing more money. Why is it fair for you to chase more money and leave loving fans that loved you at your prior team so you could go chase money? Yet it's unfair for a fan to be unhappy with you when you aren't performing well, especially when you're a player that's asking for a lot of money, demanding, commanding a lot of money. And then you don't perform to the expectations that that salary is supposed to provide. You see, there's a lot of different levels to this. And again, the players are right about one thing. Fans should support you. But when you go from first to worst, or if you're consistently and constantly bad, they're called fans for a reason. It's short for fanatics because they are a fanatic about that particular team, which means they are going to be the very first people to express their joy and their misery with that team. That's the way it works, right? There is no in between here. And again, 
if players can be unloyal and chase money and leave one organization to go to another organization, then why can a fan not show their dissatisfaction when you're not performing? Because you know one thing's for sure. If you're performing, if you're winning, if you're on your way to the postseason, you know the fans are going to show you all the love in the world. That's a given. That's a guarantee. You don't complain then. You love them then. You've got nothing bad to say about them then. You want them around you at all times then. But when you're not doing well, and when they're letting you know they're dissatisfied with the fact that you're not doing well, then all of a sudden you got a problem. Then all of a sudden you don't want to hear from them. Then all of a sudden you don't want to see them. Then all of a sudden you don't care what they think, and you don't want to hear what they think. Well, keep in mind, the fans are the ones that pay your salary. That check may say the name of the organization that you play for, but they have the ability to make that payment because the fans are the ones buying the jerseys. The fans are the ones buying the tickets. The fans are the ones showing the support. And here's another thing. If you're bad and you're not playing well and the fans are still showing up to the ballpark to try and support you and they're there trying to support you, but you disappoint yet again, then do they not have the right to let you know that you disappointed them? They're paying to be there. As long as they're not saying anything derogatory, racial, or personal, then I don't know what the problem is. Now, keep in mind, my show is a show for sports fans by a sports fan. That's what I do. So I'm going to support the sports fans at all times, which is what I'm doing here. Now, I've listened to a lot of national radio guys talk about this particular topic, and I've heard all the things they've said in regards to this particular topic, and I understand what it is they're saying. They're trying to go back and forth, and they're trying to justify this and justify that, right? And they're trying to say that, you know, fans don't have the right to be able to say whatever they want to say. That's not true. And then they tried to equate it to, well, if you were employed by an employer and the employer was showing his dis dissatisfaction with you, well, yeah, that's what they have the right to do, isn't it? A boss? Isn't that why you get write-ups? Isn't that why you get suspended? Isn't that why you don't get the promotion? Because your boss is dissatisfied with your performance? That's no different with the fans and the players. So every argument that I have heard so far in regards to these guys trying to equate this to fans don't have the right to say anything uh, negative or to be showing their displeasure with players when they're not performing, every argument that I heard is weak. Because again, if you want to bring it to the nine to fivers, then we could talk about the nine to fivers. And from a nine to five scenario, for all you national guys who try to make your weak arguments that fans are wrong in this particular regard, then I'll prove you wrong right here, right now. Simple as one, two, three. Here we go. Again, because I said it a few moments ago, but let me re-educate you one more time in regards to how it works for the nine to five worker. If your boss is dissatisfied, he has the right to write you up. He has the right to verbally let you know he's dissatisfied with your performance. He has the right to not promote you when your opportunity to get a promotion arrives. He also has the right to terminate you. So no, your arguments are weak and make no sense. The fans don't make the termination, but they do have the ability and the right to show you their dissatisfaction wholeheartedly, 100%, unequivocally, this is not even a debate. So again, I'll challenge you national guys one more time to go after the fans to one more time try and defend the players in regards to what they did by putting a thumbs down. Because again, here's the other part of the equation. There are certain industries and certain jobs where the one thing you don't want to do is alienate your fan base, TV, radio, uh, ball players, teams, organizations. The one thing you don't want to do is alienate, right? That's why we always tell them do not speak political. That's why we always tell them to make sure they mind their P's and Q's. That's why we always tell them that when they're out in public to mind what they do and be mindful of the people around them and how they are acting, right? I know I'm in radio. I've been doing it since I was 18 years old. So this is nothing new for me. So you can't tell me 
that again, you don't have to mind your P's and Q's as a ball player. And for you to attack the very people who buy the tickets, pay the paraphernalia prices, which are outrageous as it is, the outrageous parking prices to get into the parking garages and watch these games and support these teams. You cannot tell me that they don't have the right to show their dissatisfaction. As long as you're not being personal or racial, there is no issue. If they're not throwing bottles at you and doing any of the crazy stuff that fans were doing when the NBA finally let people in arenas. Now, that was outlandish. That was crazy. And that was unexcusable. But we're not talking about that. This is not that. This is simply fans showing their dissatisfaction with a team who was in first place and did a great job in going from first to worst. And they have every right to show their dissatisfaction with the team. So again, I'm going to move on to the next topic. But before I do, one more time, one final statement. Again, to the national guys who tried to make the weak arguments that you tried to make about how fans don't have the right to show their displeasure towards any ball player when they're not performing up to expectations. I tell you this, try it one more time and I'll be more than happy to rebuttal. But at the end of the day, I promise you, it's a war you will not and cannot win. There's no other way to break this down, in my opinion, than how I just broke this down right now. And if anybody has an opposing view, by all means, message the show. Let me know what your thoughts are. I'll try and put you on. I'll have no problem debating this with you. I really won't. I will absolutely have no problem debating this with you. Now, here's the funny part. So I'm glad because originally I was going to try and do this story yesterday, but I didn't get to do it. So here we are today with a follow-up story from thumbs down to thumbs up. Javier Baez apologizes, then caps the New York Mets unlikely comeback to the crowd's delight. He scores the winning run. Now, I don't know about you, but this is probably one of the craziest stories I have ever seen in a really, really long time. I won't say it's the craziest ever. But it's definitely one of the craziest stories. I, I don't even know what to make of that particular part of the story. And I don't even think it's over. There's probably going to be a part three to this thing. I don't think this story is going to go away anytime soon. But it's going to be more so because the national guys are trying to defend the players. And there is no defending the players. As a player, you're the one who should not create controversy or conflict with the very people who support you. That's just not what you do. You don't go up to your boss if you're one of these sportscasters who's sitting here trying to defend the players. You don't go up to your boss and start telling him off, do you? Because he didn't like a story that you did or he didn't like how you did it or maybe he didn't like how you delivered it. Do you then go up to your boss and start going off on him because he had negative things to say about your performance? I guarantee you don't. Or you'd be without a job or suspended or you'd be looking at not getting your contract renewed. Simple. Again, there's really, in my opinion, no other way to look at this. There's just not. All right, so another thing that happened today, uh, Cam Newton gets cut from New England. Okay, so that part, I everybody got thrown. Everybody got thrown for a loop. Nobody anticipated this happening, right? That is obvious. Nobody in their right mind anticipated this happening. Bill Belichick threw everyone for a loop when he cut Cam Newton. But to me, that's not the big part of the story. My son actually brought this up to me, and I was like sitting there texting with him. He's a Patriot fan, and he's been a Patriot fan for a while. I think I'm actually going to put him on the show. I think me and him will have this conversation on the show actually here in one of the upcoming podcasts. But the thing is this. So we were chatting back and forth, and the amazing thing that he told me was, you know, Cam Newton getting cut, first of all, he thinks it's the worst thing in the world for New England. He thinks that they can't win and have no shot at the playoffs without Cam Newton. Now, I don't know that I agree with that because my whole thought process is, look, they're both good quarterbacks. It's a system. Okay, the key to this is it's a system. So since it's a system and since Mac Jones has proven that he fits within the system, then they can do okay. 
I don't think they'll make the playoffs starting off with a pure rookie. The same reason why I say Trey Lance should not be the starting quarterback for the 49ers. And he's not going to be. Again, that's just the national guys trying to say a bunch of stuff that ain't real in order to have something to talk about. But the thing is, is that Mac Jones is a good system quarterback. So I I think New England, you know, probably going to be a good eight win team this year. I don't anticipate them winning more than eight games. And again, in another upcoming podcast, I'm going to talk about who the division winners are and what place I think the teams are going to fall in regards to their particular divisions. But I think that Mac Jones, because he fits the system and because he's a rookie and because a lot of things are going to happen and they're going to be fast, I think they can potentially win eight games. And if they win eight games, that would be a very good success, in my opinion. It really would. If they win eight games, that would be a success. Anybody who thinks that they should make the playoffs because Mac Jones is the quarterback, I think you're in for a rude awakening because that's simply just not realistic. It's just not. But again, Cam Newton gets cut. Now everybody's talking about where Cam Newton's going to land, and that's fine. That is a conversation to be had, and hopefully we'll get some resolve to that conversation here shortly. But my son and I were talking, and his big thing was Mac Jones, look at all the praise he's getting. And again, I sat, I thought about it, and it goes back to a lot of what I said about Trey Lance, and I'll probably jump on that topic here in upcoming cast. I'm not going to be able to do it today because of time. But you look at all the praise that Mac Jones is getting, and here's the thing. Folks, it's three, count them, one, two, three preseason games. That's all it is, three. Three preseason games, and you played against second, third, and fourth string players, most who are not even going to be at the in the NFL, okay? Most of them who are not even going to end up in the NFL, most of them who are going to go back to working their regular jobs that they were at because they're not NFL-skilled players. So you cannot tell me that Mac Jones impressed you so much in a preseason where he played against nothing but second, third, and fourth string guys most who are not going to be in the league. And that is enough to make you think that he's a starting quarterback in the NFL and he can lead an NFL team to the playoffs. Cam Newton was the starter the entire preseason. He's the one who went up against first string and predominantly second string. Mac Jones is the guy who came in after the fact and played against third string and fourth string. So if you go and you play third string, and fourth string, you better look good when you're playing against third and fourth string, right? Doesn't that make sense? Should you not have to be required to look good when you are trying to be a starting quarterback in the NFL and you're playing against third and fourth string in the preseason where they're not showing you full defenses, you're not seeing first string players, and they're not doing anything complicated in any way, shape, or form. It's just straight up, let's go and play some ball at the park. That's really what it is. So if you are a quarterback trying to be a starting quarterback in the NFL and you're going up against third and fourth stringers, guys who are not going to play in the NFL, and you're not getting any real defenses thrown at you, and you're just basically running basic plays, you're not doing anything special either. But yet you are supposed to be the guy who's going to be the starting quarterback. Then you better look good against defenses that aren't real and against pressure that's not coming from actual NFL players who are going to be starting in the NFL. But if you look at that and you tell me as a sports guy that you think that a guy who played against that level of competition every time, if you think that equates to him being not only a starting quarterback, but a star in the NFL, then I have to question your credibility. Because there's no way in the world you could tell me that a guy who plays against low-level competition, basically back to playing against college competition during the preseason, you cannot tell me that that shows you that he could be a starting quarterback, let alone a star in the NFL, just like Trey Lance. And again, I will start with the Trey Lance story and what I'm referring to in tomorrow's podcast, I promise you, because that's a big one for me. That's a very big one because I'm a 49ers fan and I got a lot of things to say about this Trey Lance thing. But today we're talking specifically Mac Jones. Again, my son bummed out that Cam Newton's not going to be playing for New England. 
but even more bummed out because he doesn't understand all the praise that Mac Jones is getting as if he's done something wonderful and spectacular, like win a bunch of games that they shouldn't have won. And as if they were regular season games with the ability to be able to get into the playoffs. It's like he's done all these things and accomplished all these things already, and he hasn't. Again, the level of competition he played against was poor. Most of them won't even be in the NFL. Hardly equates to a guy being a superstar in the NFL, which is what a lot of these sports guys are trying to sell you on and getting you to believe. And I'll tell you this much. At the end of the year, you're going to find out that Mac Jones is a system quarterback. He's a pretty good quarterback. His future will be looking bright, but he's not a star yet. He's not going to lead the Patriots to the playoffs. And once again, these national guys are going to be wrong because, again, they're trying to make you believe something that's not real. Now, again, I don't know if they continue to do these things because they just have nothing else to talk about and they don't know how to talk about what really is going on because there's so many other things going on, so many things they could be talking about. I don't know why they continue to do these things. I don't. And it's not all of them. I'm not saying it's all of them. I would never say it's all of them. It's not. But there's a good portion of them currently that are saying all these things about Mac Jones, like he's already a star in the NFL, like this guy's going to lead the Patriots to the Super Bowl or to the playoffs at the least. And I'm telling you more than likely that's unrealistic. They're not going to make the playoffs. They're probably going to win about eight games. And if they win eight games, that is a lot to win when you have a pure rookie quarterback. It really is. Think about it. A pure rookie quarterback comes in and you win eight games, you should be satisfied. As an organization and as a fan, you should be satisfied if you, in fact, can win at least eight games with a pure rookie quarterback. Didn't sit behind anybody for a year. Didn't take time to learn the system. Didn't watch NFL action from the actual sidelines. And if he comes in and he wins eight games, that should be a success to you as a fan and as an organization. There's no doubt about it. Trey Lance, something we're going to get into tomorrow. We will start off with that tomorrow. You guys have a great day. And unless something else crazy like this Cam Newton thing comes out, uh, we'll talk about Trey Lance tomorrow. You guys have a great day. And don't forget, go to the Twitter page, Yay or Nay Podcast. A lot of brand new Yay or Nay questions up there for you to answer now.